What is up, you savages? This is the Protect Your Neck Podcast, and I'm your host, Dan Tom, analyst and writer. You can find it at MMAJunkie.com. But on this year's program, the Protect Your Neck Podcast, we break down high-level MMA. That's what we're going to do here today, tonight, whenever you're listening to this. Hopefully, it's before the fight. I'm recording just after weigh-ins on Friday, um, which is kind of unofficial usual day since... I always aim for Thursdays, but uh, lately been getting pushed back. So apologies, folks. I had no voice yesterday. I barely have a voice today. Um, so I'm going to give you what I got. And uh, I usually try to keep expedited shorter in general, especially on Fridays and especially now. So as per usual, check the timestamps with all these breakdown shows. I'll mark when we stop the recap of the previous card and start the breakdown of the relevant show. And of course... If you don't want to listen to me in general, especially today, I don't blame you. You can skip on to the back where I recap my picks and plays at the very end of the episode. So without further ado, and with the help of Paris, the devil made me do it. Great track, a little apropos. Um, let's get to business. Of course, that track, uh, not just for fairness, right, saying that, but also because um, uh, as I try to keep it to business on these things, I'm not going to talk about current events. I already did on a previous podcast. Shout out if you listen to my interview with B. Water, director Balwin. Of course, B. Water is the Bruce Lee documentary. It's coming out on 30 for 30, June 7th. And uh, I use that avenue to talk more about current climates, as you will see the documentary is kind of relevant to that. I'm in my thoughts there. So I'm not going to get into that here. Don't worry, folks. Just wanted to plug that previous show. Thank you and shout the song. All right, UFC Apex Woodley vs. Burns happened. We went... Seven and four in picks, which is pretty bad. Uh, it would, and um, and uh, y- yeah, you could argue a couple of those went the other way. Well, I don't really care, uh, but we'll we'll go over those. Um, Burns defeated Tyron Woodley, unanimous decision. Um, wasn't surprised he dominated him or got even takedowns, but yeah, I wasn't predicting decision. And uh, my one uh, big parlay was actually hinging on. <laughs> That fight not going the dis. I had two parlays and I, every leg of both of them hit, folks. Except the one doesn't go the distance leg that I decided to throw in each one of them. And of course, in a card where everything was getting finishes, you bet your ass that yep, uh, I bet the fights <laughs> that went decision to not go. So that was it was very typical Dan Tom night. Or uh, Augustus Sakai defeating Blagoy even off by split decision. Again, I'm not going to die crazy on a hill there, but it's just like, yeah, it was a crucial, uh, I don't have an issue with 29 and 28, but yeah, it was a crucial fence grab in the third. And again, like I, I again, do as I say, not as I do, folks. I should have listened to my own warning, but yes, like I said, you got to be careful when picking the counterfighters or people that are doing technical, quiet body work that impress the shit out of me or people that actually know striking. But we're still in the era of big man swing hard. He gets points. Um, so it's kind of how the judging goes. Uh, so Sakai eked out another win. Uh, hopefully that just means we can fade him in the future. Uh, Billy Quarantillo. Billy Quarantine. Billy Quarantine defeated Spike Lyle. Still, see, I still mustered up for you guys. I got to save it up for Brown Bear later. You know what's coming. Uh, but Billy Q, man, um, I know me and fucking Derek Love probably, you know, molded some diamonds. Uh, shout out Derek Love. I know I he was expecting the podcast to be out on Thursday, although you should know me better of all people. That being said, uh, no excuses. That's my bad, whether it's new listeners or old listeners. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be on there for you. So apologize, Mr. Love. But, yeah, both me and D, uh, D. Love were on the um, our, our favorite prop, the third round uh, finish. You know, I don't roll those off too often these days but when i do it's it's for good reason folks it's for good reason and we saw the fight pretty much play out exactly why but spike carlyle is so tough it was really tough uh, i couldn't get that but not for without trying so shouts to you billy q and i'm glad the judges got that one right by awarding damage and submission catches a metric that's not awarded enough as i said on twitter roosevelt roberts defeated brock weaver via submission or a naked choke yeah Expected that, I guess, right? Duran defeated Hannah Cyphers via sub knee bar. Okay. Good on her. It's expected. Uh, Chukagian. She was the live dog, in fact. Um, defeated Shevchenko. Unanimous yeah, decision. Good on her. 30 25. Domination. Daniel Rodriguez defeated Davio Green. That was the second fight that I bet that wouldn't go the distance. Of course, that one goes. Like, these guys have, like, one decision between them. 
Um, J- Jamal, thank you for those of you shouting out with the uh, Finding Forrester gifs. Jamal, yes. That's right, Jamal. <laughs> Book you, William. Um, beat Klitsen of Brayu. Just washed him. Uh, so that was a bad that, that was a bad beat. Waiting for that dog money on a Brayu. Money came in on Hill for a reason, and he was, like I said, um, a, a very bad matchup with that southpaw versus southpaw. So I should have listened to myself. Uh, Brandon Royval defeated Tim Elliott. Hard on himself, so I was glad to see him get the bonus in that sense. Um, really impressive, and won me over. <coughs> um, along with Roosevelt Roberts, Casey Kenny saved my ass, and some of the listeners' ass, if you were following me on that parlay. Defeats Luis Smoka by submission, which, you know, sucks to see Smoka fall that way, but it's what it is. Page note, Luis Smoka, he'll come up in this next breakdown. Chris Gutierrez defeated Vince Morales via second round TKO with the leg kicks. Um, again, I didn't do tape study, so I'm not going to bump my chest hard, but the kicks and the leg kicks was what um, had me leaning toward Chris Gutierrez. Thanks, gorgeous George, for the shout on MMA Junkie Radio again. Check those guys out. All right, that was UFC Apex and the time now. Seven minutes. We're doing pretty good, huh? So we're going to get through this pretty fast. As per usual, folks, we're going to go top to bottom as we break down UFC 250, which also takes place here in Las Vegas in the Apex. Um, you know, it's it's pretty crazy. Um, shout out to another listener, Love to Travel. Um, said something about DraftKings in my DMs here. I'm looking... Yeah, I've talked to other people too, and uh, I'm going to try to address that. But yeah, I've, I've not been good at giving love ever since I stopped doing my DraftKings articles. Um, I've not been good at giving love to the fantasy sports, so I'm going to try to address that. And um, in general, for gaming in general, I actually have more in the works coming for you guys. So, hint, hint. Um, so yeah, uh, just wanted to note that. All right, the card is headlined with a featherweight title fight. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, Amanda Nunez, minus 550. Uh, Felicia Spencer, come back on her, plus 425. Line tightened up a bit, as it should. Uh, but, I mean, it's still wide. Uh, and, you know, again, you can't complain because it's Amanda Nunez. She's the GOAT. And she's justifiably favored slash should win this fight. However, like I said earlier, don't be surprised if you see me pick Felicia Spencer, which, spoiler alert, I did not. However, I do stand by my previous warnings, even after running... Uh, this fight through the proverbial comb as <clears throat> I watched a, a ton of footage, almost everything I could as far as the in-depths I wrote, and wrote for this card, but didn't do a ton of deep footage after, which of course, as per usual, I will readily admit and acknowledge to you guys. That being said, I still have picks. Um, I still have plays, though I will caution you even more not to follow me off those proverbial cliffs. Um, and as per usual, I will be 100% honest and give you what I got for free. But uh, I, I do apologize because I do take pride in my work. And again, with um, everything going on from uh, the world to the world, unfortunately, to, you know, the extra work that your boy took on this week threw me the F off. And, you know, yeah, migraines and no voice. It kind of makes it hard. So I'll let you guys know for the fights that I'm... Um, I'll come clean. But this one, this one I, I watched. And yeah, I think Spencer should be <clears throat> a live dog, especially if this goes on. It's one of those things where, what did I say? I forget what fight I held it for. I don't remember if it paid off, but it was a couple fights ago I used as the example for one of the most dangerous, quietly dangerous archetypes in picking slash betting fights, which is the fight where the person, no one's disagreeing who's favored and who's the underdog. And maybe we can disagree on the wideness of the line, but that's not so much to this point, uh, to the archetype of matchup, which is you have, again, a justified favorite. But you're not exactly sure how they're going to finish it. You know, Amanda Nunes has improved her wrestling. She's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, and people don't know she also came from judo, where she technically holds a brown belt, but on the grounds where she's traditionally been beaten, and even in this dominant run, for those who know what they're watching, or even those who credit submission catches as they should, you will notice that there were definitely some lapses in concentration. Now, thankfully, Nunez's gas tank was there, which has abandoned her before. That's been a part of her new run since with American Top Team, but we still saw some lapses of concentration. 
um, which I would argue more than it was, regardless of Durant and me skill being poor or underrated or whatever argument you want to take there. I still think it comes down to a lapse of concentration for Nunez. Um, Spencer, her leg dexterity, she's more of a top player, but she can fight from her back and, you know, if Duranami made things worrisome, then then Spencer can. You know, she she, she starts locking in submissions with those thighs, those tick toys. Easy, Connor. Um, tick toys. Um, <coughs> Jesus, Dan. Easy, Dan. Um, you know, her leg dexterity from Taekwondo translates there. But yes, Felicia Spencer's a top player, and, and Felicia Spencer. You know, so let me finish this archetype first. So we have a, a fighter that again. We're sure she should win in Amanda Nunez, but when you actually break down how they could win, it gets dicey. You know, where she's not just justified to be favorite, you, she's justified to be a heavy favorite, whatever your version of a heavy favorite is for MMA, right? But like I said before, with even though I did technically I pick Cyborg inside the distance, I think I made the same decision because if you read the breakdown, I say, you know, Spencer looks deceptively durable, folks. You can kind of just tell these things. And especially within the female ranks where that certain level of athleticism, umph, um, uh, goes for the attitude uh, and all of that package goes a long way. And I don't mean like a bad attitude. I mean just like a persevering attitude. It goes a long, long way in those divisions. Especially when you have, you know, tangible skills you can attach it to. Um, one second, get a little bit of echo. All right, sorry. And uh, so, you know, she's very durable, right? Um, so if Amanda Nunes doesn't knock her out, yeah, Nunes knocks Cyborg out, but does that mean she's going to knock Spencer out? Um, <clears throat> you know, what if she doesn't? I don't know if she's going to submit her. In fact, if she tries to submit her, unless she rocks her and is on top of her, in that case, yeah, maybe she gets her out of there. That's probably the more realistic path to a finish. It's kind of a combination of both, right? One lens to the other, the old club and sub. But if she's hard and never been finished, then you got a decision her. And you got a decision a fighter for five rounds, not three like Cyborg had to. And a fighter who not so much doesn't show to get tired, but leading me to the second archetype, one of the more dangerous, that Diego Sanchez archetype, that heavy pressure. Um starts a little slow but picks up steam real fast and keeps that keeps it and keeps going uh, those fighters can be nightmares you know um i refer to this like to archetype before if you know as a coach or, or you know if, if you could want one type of fighter you want a fighter that gets after it you can't teach that you know you you, you kind of got to be born with that and you can give them skills and you can place tools on that fighter but you need a fighter that's going to get after it and not be afraid and, you know, Nunez appears to have conquered her fears of gassing out, but has she? I don't know. I'm not her. She's still showing some lapses of concentration, even in their proved uh, cardiovascular state. So, <clears throat> I actually picked Nunez by decision. I think she can dictate enough of the fight. You know, she's shown underrated uh, counter grappling, although not a lot of girls have grappled her, even early on in her career. Um, training with Kayla Harrison, who she looks bigger than Kayla in pictures, which is kind of crazy. So, unless Nunez is Anthony Johnsoning herself and gives herself a tougher cut than expected, um, I feel like she can win three and a half to four rounds and then have to survive the last. Like, it could be like, I, I could totally see her winning a decision where Spencer wins round five um, by coming along, you know, the last half of round four where Nunez lets her back in the fight. And, you know, you end up with a situation where she's mounted at the end. And it's very like, uh, speaking apropos to Canadian title challengers, you know, it's very, I think we get a scene that's very kind of apropos to a Mark Hominick, Jose Aldo in this fight. That's essentially my prediction, folks. <coughs> no place for the line inflation. Um, I'm tempted to take a shot on that over just because it's simply because it's set at, I think, one and a half. But... Again, what if Nunez does start you out? I mean, Nunez is who I'm picking to win, so I get it. Next fight, co-main event, uh, if we want to call it that. No offense to the fighters. It's just, again, the co-main event. Further, further my point, guys. 
what did I say in 2020? The co-main event has officially died. I saw it happening last year. <coughs> and, uh, you know. And I love how Viola and Sun Tzu. And, yes, Cody Garbrandt. I got love for him, too. And he's got name value. I'm not hating folks. But the other in-depth I wrote was on San Hagen's Darling, which we'll get to in a second, if that tells you anything. So, um, Cody Garbrandt, minus 140. Rafael Asuncao, plus 120. I believe the line shifted on that. I want to open up here. I know money's coming in on Cody, but I don't know if the line outright flipped, which wouldn't surprise me. Um, it's like Cody should win. He's the younger guy. It's about time for Rafael Asuncao to fall off a cliff. 30, you know, 38, 39 is old for a bantamweight. Um, Cody Garbrandt's got to get back on track, right? He's only 28. He's got kids. The UFC put a lot into him. These aren't how stories go, but it's also MMA, you know? Um, that being said, even MMA and its sadness and droughts that it puts on fighters, storylines, fans, or promotions alike, even those, I dare say, tend to have limits, right? Um, so what happens there as I, these pages keep stifling me up? Now, Garbrandt's been sticking right around the favorite, actually. No, mine's been been pretty uh, it's been roughly you know uh, staying steady i took a sun sound staff picks i didn't change it um i thought about it i didn't watch too much footage uh, on this um because i was so wrapped up in my things um shout out to the fight site uh, i know they wrote uh, some really great pieces there on a sun sound garbrandt of course i didn't read them um because i didn't want those words to come out here but i definitely am planning on checking that out um and i think you know there's been a lot of talk you know and speaking of just publications on cody as far as like you know what happens since that master class to dom cruise um when you look at it in that sense he had his best performance against a counterfighter by out countering the counterfighter Cody Garbrandt's aggressive, but he quietly counters in there, which was the reason why I was picking him against guys like uh, Tomas Almeida back in the day. I was at that fight live, actually. That was a fun card. Um, so how does he do against another counter striker, especially one uh, more dedicated, uh, a little more conservative, and a little more standard from the outside looking in? Although, you know, Asun Sao will be doing some quietly crafty things and switching his stance as well. Obviously, not as flamboyant as Cruz, obviously. Different fighters there, but nevertheless, a counter fighter, right? Um, and the counter right hand. And I think that's the thing, you know, uh, which right hand's going to land? Again, you got speed and athleticism in right hand. It's not like you can't tag Asun Sao, especially as of late. Uh, Marlon Marais, right? I didn't go back to watch their second fight, but you, you get what I'm saying. <clears throat> um, that speed there. Um, you know, also, a Sun Tzu tends to slow in that third round, as we see. Uh, and Garbrandt sounds like he knows that. He's done his homework. Um, it sounds like he wants to cook him by using feints, which makes sense because he's a counterfighter, and it makes sense because he's going to be training with Mark Henry. So, on paper, this could be a really good match. You want to... You want a more of a process-driven, command-driven corner with feints to draw out counters, uh, tight, family-knit kind of environment. Uh, keep a guy like Cody comfortable. Keep him confident because when he's confident, he's going to be his best. So I, I got love for Mark Henry. Um, I think that makes sense if you're a Garbrandt supporter, and perhaps that's why he's slightly favored. However... One of the things that was shocking is when Pedro Munoz, before he hurt Cody, I totally forgot he hurt him with leg kicks before in their fight, Cody Garbrandt's last fight. And if you really look at it, Cody Garbrandt's not really facing leg kickers. Um, minus Thomas Almeida, who is more of an inside leg kick, and he got knocked out in the first round. But, you know, the guys who can really even throw decent leg kicks, he's knocking out early. He really doesn't have good experience against leg kickers and with his boxing style it would kind of make sense that there was a kind of a hidden culprit there and now tj was kind of head hunting so uh, if the fights played out longer perhaps we would have seen him settle down and go to the legs like he did with dominic cruz or uh yeah dominic like like yeah like 
Dillashaw did with Cruz in their fight in Boston. Um, so we didn't really get to see that narrative play out. And even though the fight, of course, went goes fast once again with Munoz, Munoz, um, those leg kicks were there. And with all the potential upside that could come with a Mark Henry camp change, one thing that's probably not going to be addressed very well is the leg kicks. Um, unless he goes and, and turns them into level-changing shots, which Garbrandt does have the reactionary shot, very underrated. Would love to see him go more to his wrestling, in fact. And even though I feel his wrestling is good enough to deter a Sun Sound, both his takedowns to where if he does get taken down, I see him getting up with immediacy. Uh, Garbrandt's really good at that. However, back to him being offensive to offlet or counter leg kicks as being one of the only options that he's you know, shown. Does he want to do that with a Sun Sao? You know, Sun Sao's not like a dangerous guard or, or guillotine guy, although he's actually got a... He works well from the front headlock. Um, but as we saw with a Sun Sao against Sanhagen, who is an underrated scrambler in his own right, obviously much different fighter in frame, but Sanhagen, more importantly, hurt him and was piecing him up. The fight didn't look, it looked like it was going to be a Sanhagen fight and didn't look like he was going to get out of there. But a Sun Sao uses his veteran savvy to... Poker face, counter, clinch, and 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 uh, trick. Which page note to that wasn't too hard. We'll we'll get onto that. We talk about Corey Sanhagen. Um, get him into grappling affairs, whether he was winning or losing, and and it was allowing the Suns out to recover. <clears throat> so does Garbrandt want to get in any of those tricks? Because the Suns has got some crafty tricks, like that turtle transition I posted uh, in that Sterling uh, in that Sanhagen fight. That was awesome. So I, I don't know if he wants to do that. And a Sun has got some underrated kicks. I mean, regardless of what you think of that Sterling fight, um, you know, he'll go kick for kick with you, even if that's your strength. So not just for the counter right hand, but actually for the kicks, I'm going to pick a Sun Sao because I think between both of them being counter fighters and Garbrandt, not just perhaps being conservative coming off of three stoppage losses, but... What, do I also, what else do I always talk about, folks, when there's a camp change? It's always that adjusting period. It varies for everybody. But we could very well see an adjusting period. And what happens in an adjusting period? Again, more conservativeness. So I feel like this fight goes to the decision. Um, if it does end by knockout, it's really a coin flip on who that is. But I think it goes to the decision. And in that case, um, I feel like a Sun Tao's leg kicks will be scoring. And if he doesn't knock Garbrandt out with that counter right hand, I think he's going to land enough of them clean um, to maybe, and hopefully not, man, because you you want to see Cody bounce back strong and hopefully he just comes out and blasts a Sun Sao as much as I love him and, and gets everybody excited about him. For Cody's career, that, that's what's needed, right? But I could also see a Sun Sao, even if he doesn't knock him out, like maybe tagging him with a couple counter rights early and Cody kind of being even more conservative, right? So there's too many flags there. i got to pick a Sun Sao. Um, at Dog Money, I sprinkled on him small, folks. Um, don't follow me off a cliff, um, half a unit. All right. <clears throat> Next fight. Let's pull up some fresh odds here. Should be Aljamain Sterling is your slight favorite, minus 115 the last time I looked with the comeback. No longer a plus line. Again, slight odds, minus 105. Uh, 107 to 113 now. Minus 107, I should say, Corey Sanhagen. Um, so pretty much a pick em fight as it should be, folks. It, it, you know, um, I end up picking up Sterling early, and as I go into my footage, you know, I'm, I'm seeing why. Um, you know, you, you, you kind of get worrisome. You don't see a lot of his wrestling um, as strong, both in the stats and in the fights. But then you're like, okay, is it because this guy's a good jiu-jitsu guy? Um, is it because he is wanting to uh, show off some new striking tools, which to his credit, I mean, he's really made some, not just over the years, but especially in his last fight, uh, Aljo. So, I mean, okay, that's, whether you agree with it or not, he's clearly putting in the work on his striking. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, I've referred to this often, and uh, again, things I refer to often on the show, my canary in coal mines on wrestlers, which is old, young, offensive, defensive, um, funk, freestyle, Greco. Like, it almost doesn't matter the style. 
all MMA fighters just seem to go away from their wrestling. Um, offense first, of course. Which is worrisome when you need a guy to wrestle in this kind of a fight. <clears throat> Take a sip of coffee here. Now, when I listen to interviews of Sterling, which, again, interviews on everything, I try to go more analysis interviews, but interviews are also very useful. So thank you for my colleagues who provide those. Aljo, I thought he had a shoulder surgery. It was a wrist surgery, and uh, apparently that was messing up his grips. And, again, one of the things I like about Aljo, I remember studying his Instagram once, uh, doing the normal things for my, my, my studies there, and um, he had one thing where he was wrestling and he was grabbing a wrist, and it's when in doubt, grab a wrist. And I'm like, oh, this guy's from the same school as me in that regard. All about wrist control. It's the unsung hero of wrestling, grappling, everything. It's wrist control, hand fighting. And apparently his wrist was damaging his grip in that regard. So now when I'm looking back at the footage and stats, it kind of makes sense that the, that, that was a hampering problem. Um, because he's a pretty flexible guy. There's not There doesn't seem like there's one type of entry Aljo likes. You'll see him hit reactionary shots early in his career. You'll see him hit them later. Uh, doubles. Um he will. He has really, really crap. He likes to finish with his feet. It seems like you know, with his little crafty uh, trips from the clinch. Um, but he'll go from clinch to single, single to clinch, to and from. He he changed very well from there. He seems to really work well from the clinch and singles. Um, that seems to be more his bread and butter, I would say, than than shooting the double. Um, but uh, but yeah, you look at that, and that that kind of makes sense. Um, <clears throat> if that is the case, and then you listen to the interviews, and he's talking about wanting a Khabib, Sanhagen, um, and I'm like, okay, that's exactly what you want to hear. Um, if you're a Sterling supporter, right? Grip's good. He wants to Khabib him. It's it's only three rounds, so you know Aljo's played it fast and loose. You know he'll may he he doesn't mind having a tequila and lime on fight week, and you know that's that's agave plant, little lime, a little water. It's not terrible. You look at this last dance and these elite athletes like Michael Jordan. These guys are like smoking cigars and drinking beers between the games and stuff on planes. I'm like, Jesus Christ, guys, aren't you, aren't you, uh, aren't you worried about preservation? <laughs> Come on, Scott. Come on, Scott. Scott Burrell. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, you know, but we've seen him slow down in the third round. Now, could it be due to that? Who knows? You know, he's big for 135, man. And he looks in shape coming into this fight, Aljo, but he also looks big. Um, So this is a three-rounder in the smaller cage, so that's all good things. And, again, for Sanhagen, I love, man, I love Corey Sanhagen. I'm, st <sighs> like, I was a huge fan of him coming in. Uh, we interviewed him at MMA Junkie Radio from his LFA days. Um, so getting to see him then and... Like, this is my kind of fighter, my kind of favorite fight, you know, favorite style of fighter. Um, and, and just, he's a martial artist, in and out of the cage kind of dude, just the way he talks and holds himself, like, yeah, yeah. Makes me, he's like, make you want to be a better person type of dude. And this sport and world certainly needs a, a lot of those. So, you know, forget my pick, which, spoiler alert, it's Aljo. Uh, I'm, I'm very much rooting for Sanhagen here. Um, and would not be mine being wrong as well. And that's the thing against Aljo. I love Aljo too. I'm just saying. I've been talking about Aljo, not talking about Sanhagen. Don't get it twisted, folks. I, I love Corey Sanhagen. I love his style. It was fun writing about it. Um, I don't think any of my articles hit yet, but I think they should. At least one should be hitting today as you guys hear this. Hopefully both hit today. Um, but keep an eye out for my, my Sanhagen and Sterling article uh, writing about his striking because. I mean, the guy is very fluid. He'll do, you know, a lot of tricks. He'll do the dart, darting, um, uh, you know, much more efficient than an Eddie Alvarez. He'll be drop-stepping like a TJ Dillashaw. Uh, he'll be kind of shuffling and edging in on distance like he's Dominic Cruz, leaning his shoulder down, giving an angle, giving a hard blunt, you know, giving a hard uh, uh, blunt side of, of his body to target. Um and he does my favorite thing, folks. He digs the fucking body. Oh. And again, for a nice guy, as I'm praising him like the second coming of Christ, he looks like the most sadistic evil motherfucker when he tags people to the body. 
Like, I feel like Sanhagen loves punishing and breaking dudes to the body. And that's my favorite kind of fighter. I mean, this is this is like, uh, you know, 135 Max Holloway, you know, on the, coming on the scene. Just digging hooks and uppercuts to the body. I love it. I think those are going to be worthwhile. And so will his leg attacks. Um, when you look at the, you know, Aljo's last fight with Pedro... Pedro Munoz, um, with Pedro Munoz, uh, I think you know, the, those attacks will definitely be worthwhile. Worthwhile, cool whip, um, and um, and yeah, the, you know, I was really impressed with uh, San Hagen's scrambling. However, what's the common thread? Whether it's the Mario Batistas or Austin Arnett's of the world, is that these guys are getting him, are clinching him when they want to. They're getting San Hagen to the cage when they want to. Again, even like the Austin Arnett's and Mario Bautista's of the world, I believe, are taking them down when they want to and getting the angles and deep body lock where you're working toward the back. Now, those guys couldn't hold the position and or take the position in some cases, but that's not Aljamain Sterling. Aljamain Sterling will take the position. The question is, does he take the round with you or does he take a limb with him? Um, because he'll either try to Nelson you, rear naked choke you. He'll take your legs if they're there, if we saw in the Stammen fight. And if not, it's hard to shake him. He's probably going to bank around. You know, it's, he's going to give that, you know, that, that, you know, again, betters when you're betting on a guy who's a back taker and he takes the back, you're like, yes, because, you know, he's either going to finish or get the round. You're like, you can relieve a little bit of pressure of the bullets that you're probably sweating, right? <coughs> so that was a huge flag. Again, small cage. Again, Seinhagen's getting better at these things, but. Even in his last fight, where he showed impressive scrambling against an underrated guy, um, as far as grapplers and submission threats goes, yes, he's not a Charles Oliveira when you look at his record or style, but Sun Tzu is legit. And yes, that was awesome. But you know, again, when God, I hate those in corner interviews, and I feel bad for Megan because you know, Olivia, because they don't, you know, you can tell she doesn't want to do them. That's a that's a production brass call, folks. But like, even their own quarter is admitting you're getting kind of that pure moment, you know. Um, I don't think Elliot Marshall can filter too well, if, even if he wanted to, because he's trying to corner, right? And he's saying, we're just worried about the ground. So long as he's off the ground, we're good. That's the only place where the opponent can win. I mean, the, the corner is admitting it themselves. You know what I'm saying? Now, I don't think Sterling's going to be able to submit Sam Hagen, even though I'm picking him to win. But again, I do think that he can control him for two out of the three rounds and survive the third if it ends up being on the feet or he ends up a little tired. This were a five round fight, I'd be picking Sanhagen. Even at this stage, this just seems like where Sterling finally puts himself over, and Sanhagen has to hit a bump in the road, whether it be small or not. And it's not just me pontificating there. I mean, Sterling again, he's not relying on old tricks. He is improving. Like he was throwing, like the amount of check jabs and check hooks he was throwing from both sides. Uh, you know, checking jabs, I should say. Uh, elbows, like slick, you know, John Jones like elbows over the top, sliding over with the hand fighting. Um, his work in the clinch, uh, you know, and, and it sounds like his priorities are straight. It sounds like he's healthy. Um, so, yeah, man, I think I think uh, I think Sterling can take this. And and one of the things Sanhagen does, he he tripods a lot. And again. He's got good back defense, and he knows how to bait guys into a high mount. But I don't know if he's going to be able to um, to be able to take those risks with uh, with with Aljamain Sterling. Request there from from my dude Gabe Killing, and he liked the Stallone impression. He wanted me to break down a fight as Stallone, so maybe um, you know maybe I'll do the next fight as as Stallone. But I'm going to take um, Aljamain Sterling. I'm not going to play it, even if he goes down to dog money. Though the value will, at that point, I will say it's on him. But it's so close. I love this fight so much, and I like both guys. Um, this is on the avoid list. You just sit back and watch this one, folks. Um, I don't know if I'll do the, the my voice can do, so, sorry, listeners, like the, the Stallone, but uh, I don't know if my voice can do the whole thing. But you know, we got Rocco, so we'll do, do uh, Anthony Rocco Martin. Neil Magny is your uh, favorite minus 125 comeback on Anthony Rocco Martin plus 105. Hey, yo, Mick, I like this guy Rocco, you know. Uh, yeah, he's uh, he's pretty good, you know. Yeah, Rock, but he's he's got the same problem as you. You got to you got to watch out for the for the rear naked choke, Rock. Hey, you know, Mick, about the rear naked choke. 
you know, yeah, I don't know about if we have to really be naked when we're drilling it all the time. You know, Adrian walked in and, yeah, she's concerned. <laughs> she's, she's not five seconds of trying to break down a fight as Stallone, and I'm turning, further turning his relationship into Mickey into a sexual one. This is the Protect Your Neck podcast, folks. Everything got a little blurry after that, Mick. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, you know, um, Rocco Martin, man, he, he, he's, he's scrappy, but like, uh, what was it, was it, was that listening to, was it, was it Brad Taschuk from the uh, MMA analysis over there that was saying something about like, he, he shows flashes, but even in like this evolution really hasn't been the guy to put it together. I don't know if those were his exact words, but it was in the spirit and in that spirit, or at least the words that I'm giving to you guys, I, I agree. Uh, if, if that was Brad, he said it well, but yeah. And Magny, again, we probably shouldn't have been surprised that, um, he came through as an underdog, I believe against, uh, Li Jing Liang, uh, I can <laughs> retard strength. Jesus, Dan, come on. Well, there's worse things in the art world uh, than the art word folks. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, but like, you know, uh, being able to kind of manhandle and, and just, you know, um, you know uh, kind of, you know, uh, busy bee buzzard, uh, you know, um, overwhelm guys, if you will, with his, with his kind of lanky volume. And I could see that happening here. Um, unless Rocco Martin's able to take him out with calf kicks, I think those are going to be his best weapon. Uh, look for those. Uh, other than that, I think if Magni can pressure him um, and get him into that ugly clinch fight, uh, I think his wrestling is, is better, and it's going to take away a lot of the levers and length that uh, Rocco Martin naturally has and likes to use. I think Magni just uses them better, is bigger, and has been using them longer at this division. So um, his crew seems to be on a good vibe. You know, they got the elevation training and a good training uh, situation. I didn't get to peek at Rocco Martins, who I think he's still in Atlanta. But, I mean, you know, things have been kind of jumpy with him. Um, hopefully him and his mother are well. But I got to pick Neil Magny here. Um, and for the low cost of entry, minus 125. Again, folks, I did not hardcore tape study this fight. So don't follow me off a cliff. But as it went down from minus 135 to even minus 125, I just I just took a unit shot just for the fuck of it. Don't follow me off the cliff, just being honest with what I'm playing. All right, uh, Sean O'Malley minus 500, comeback on Eddie Wine plus 400. All right, um, yeah, I got I got O'Malley here. I'll be rooting for Wineland, you know, because I'm a fan of the older guys and uh, whatnot. Um, and, you know. It's going to be that prospect loss as far as UFC time sometime for Sean. But, man, do I like what Sean is doing. I like that, you know, say what you will about his, his stick, which I don't mind. Uh, I, but um, the dude is a fighter, you know, showed that he was using that time off wisely and makes him almost impossible to forecast here. Um, but I predict, it, it, you know, this could be very similar um, to uh, – what fighting fight was it going to be similar to do then? What is it? Tell him. Um, but I could see him, you know, just sitting back, countering, being the faster guy, and just just kind of piecing him up, um, like Dotson, maybe going kind of similar to the Dotson fight, if my memory serves. Uh, so I'm going to take Sean O'Malley there, but between the line being wide and the flags on both sides of, of not knowing, um, I'll stay away. But yeah, obviously the picks O'Malley inside. Chase Hooper, Ash Ketchum, is a uh, minus one ninety five against Alex Caceres plus one sixty eight. Yeah, man, it's tough. Um, Chase Hooper's going to be due for his UFC prospect loss sometime soon too, and Alex Caceres is typically the guy that does it and does it by submission. That being said, he has lost more than submission than he has won. Believe it or not, that is Alex Caceres, which doesn't uh, portend too great against a guy like Chase Hooper who is scrappy. Um, and can take a beating <laughs> and keep his cool at the very least with it. So um, I don't think Alex Caceres, you know, he, he he's a better striker and he does hit harder, don't get me wrong, and he does hit hard enough to hurt Chase. I'm not saying that. But he's not a one-shot knockout guy. 
Uh, so for that reason, I feel like even if he hurts Chase, he's going to end up letting him back in the fight. I mean, again, it's like, you know, was it that Mexican dude, Martin, Martin Bravo and stuff, even against like lower level dudes like Alex Caceres will find ways to lose or give away the fight. Um, and I like Alex Caceres, but he's just so hard to trust. So for that reason, I'm actually going to take the more limited newcomer, Chase Hooper. But no matter what the line reads, you can't be confident in it on either side. So that's on my avoid list. Um, this line's one back and forth. That was fun. But Ian Heinish is your favorite at minus 130. Gerald Mearshart, GM3, plus 110. Um, I like both guys here. You know, Ian Heinish, it's got that deceptive style I kind of like to bet on where he starts slow and comes from behind and kind of just outworks guys. But it really kind of bit him in the ass. Slash, you start to wonder, did he hit a plateau? Or is there just, you know, stuff going on in the personal life that, that is leading to a plateau performance-wise the last two? Are we seeing that kind of luck run its run its course? We've seen him lose to opportunistic southpaws who have Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts before. Uh, and uh, Marcus Perez. Uh, but, so Gerald Mearshart uh, is live here. And uh, for that reason, I'm going to pick him here. Of course, you know me. I, I do love me some GM3. Um you know, just just a just from style seems like a tough dude, good dude, and then you you, you see him do stuff with um, colleagues like Aaron Bronstetter are showing the music side. So I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm a bit biased here, folks. I'm gonna take Gerald Mearshart and then play him. So I'm just stating that so you know what my bias is a little bit biased and not a lot of tape study in this pick. But I went and played Mearshart anyways for um, plus one ten. Yeah, I got him at the same at half a unit. Again, don't fall me off that cliff. Um, next fight, it's on the avoid, but you don't got to follow me off a cliff on who to pick because it's deceiving, you know. Cody Stamen, minus 250, your favorite comeback on Brian Kelleher, plus 210. Um, obviously, you know, news hit with Cody Stamen losing his 18-year-old brother. That's just freaking sad, and I don't know how he was able to keep training. Um, but he, through COVID and even personal loss, has apparently been a picture of inspiration. Uh, active, in shape, never taking days off during this whole quarantine. So we'll see how he performs. You know, does he does he put on a does is a conservative guy puts on a conservative performance? Just let it out there like he should be. You know, and not coming at Cody by saying that. I'm just you know I'm just just talking frankly, right? Or does you know God forbid does he come out and does we get we get a, a Jake Seal Jake Shields Jake Ellenberger? You guys remember that Jake Shields losing his father and what happened to that fight? Um, you know, who knows? Um, Kelleher is going to be very live. He starts slow and picks up late. Volume can win you a lot of things. It'll be volume versus countering. But, you know, Kelleher can change levels and is, is, is sharpening up his striking too. And Cody Stammen, though, his wrestling really impressed the hell out of me watching the Aljamain Sterling fight. I know he ends up getting submitted, but you forget the work that he does before that. There's some really nice wrestling that's being done by Cody, at least in my opinion for what it's worth. And you gotta wonder if uh, apologies, Benjamin. There, you gotta wonder if uh, one second. All right, sorry about that, but yeah, you gotta wonder um, how that. Uh, what, what do you have to wonder, Dan? I don't know what fight was I. <laughs> the dog was barking. People are probably shouting at the microphone. Get on with it. Oh, with the takedowns. Uh, you got to wonder, will it be shut down by Kelleher's guillotine choke? Um, you know, he's been able to put out Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts like uh, Yuri Alcantara with that thing. So it's a really tricky fight. The value is definitely on Del uh, Kelleher. And perhaps if the personal story to Stamin not training at Extreme Couture with uh, my guy Eric Nixick and that bias... If both those things weren't in play, perhaps I would be picking and even playing Kelleher here. But Stamen is the deserved favorite, bias aside. And with the bias, I think, you know, I think we're going to see a, a better. It's going to bring out a um, an emotional Cody Stamen who's got a lot to show. So rooting for Cody, picking Cody. Uh, Charles Bird minus one seventy five, Maki Patolo plus one fifty five. Charles Bird always reminds me of. Um, I hope this doesn't come off as racist, um, but I, I get these guys confused. I'm just being honest. Like, for example, Chris Gutierrez and uh, the guy he fought, I always get them too confused too. 
Um, I don't think it's a Hispanic thing. I mean, both those guys are really fair-skinned, kind of malleable-looking dudes. Um, so not, not so much a, just a race as a little, little literal thing, but actually this is more of a thematic thing. He reminds me of, who's that guy, the training partner, John Jones? He, he fought him too, like for Christ's sakes. Um, why don't you look it up, Dan? You have the tab in front of you, dummy. Well, <laughs> I got hit in the head a little too much. Um, fucking hell. No, he didn't fight him. Jesus Christ. Now, what are you think? Did he? I don't know. No, he didn't. God damn it. See, this is how confusing. Um, I get Darren Stewart did fight him, though. They both fought Darren Stewart. Bevon Lewis, that's who it is, folks. Sorry about that. Bevon Lewis. And not because he trains with a John Jones and perhaps, you know, it's the training partner effect and we kind of see them plateau out from there, which maybe we'll talk about a John Jones training partner to that effect later. But, um, you know, perhaps you look at it as just suffering these kind of getting pushed to the big show too early. Although, you know, he had a healthy amount of LFC access fights between some Dana White contenders uh, stints. But still, you know, you're just like, did, did he get pushed there too early and take some, some tough losses? Now he's got to come back from two TKL losses. We haven't seen him in over a year. Um, but... You know, against Maki Patolo, I think he's going to have to wrestle him and really stay away from his kickboxing uh, credentials slash background because that hadn't served him well in the past two fights. Um, but again, folks, between legitimately, non biasly not being able to trust Bird to, you know, biasly wanting to go for a Hawaiian with knockout power, chin, and a plus money next to his name, yes, I'm going to pick and sprinkle on Patolo, but do not follow me off this cliff. Uh, plus 155, it should be a stay away, but it, it's dog or pass if you are going to humor yourself. Um, next fight, Alex Perez, minus 135 versus Juicy A, Juicy J, Formiga, plus 115. Formiga, another underrated dude, doesn't get a lot of love, who I love, but I'm actually going to be picking against him because I like Alex Perez. Um, real big fan of his style. Uh, I think he's gotten past those early submission losses. Um, and can more importantly kind of dictate the fight with his wrestling. Um, his striking is really good, his power, which, uh, you know, uh, he will go to the body, uh, which I think he's going to need to do a lot more of here because that's the key to beating Juicy Formiga is body work, right? If you look at all the knockouts, a lot of them come from body work. Um, and, yeah, he's been TKO'd, but, like, that was from a headbutt, and he had to be stopped, like, twice in that fight against Joseph Benavidez. And even Joseph Benavidez admits it was a headbutt. Um, but Joseph Benavidez just got the better of it in that fight. Unfortunately, not his title fight. Um, it sucks because I'm a Joby fan. So, yeah, I think Alex Perez takes it. I didn't play Perez. Uh, I may put him on a f attach him on a fun parlay, uh, which is um, uh, right now just a two-piece uh, for plus money which is uh, Magni and somebody else uh, I, I, I tagged together. But Perez by TKO is plus 315, and I sprinkled a quarter unit on that because I think any TKO is Juicy A, which sucks for Juicy A if that's the case. All right, uh, the second leg of that parlay piece is Alonzo Minifield, minus 225 versus Devin Clark. Come back on the underdog, plus 185. Brown Bear, come on, Dave. Uh -huh. Come on, Dave. <laughs> you know, that was the one I was saving up for. Uh, Devin Brown, Bear Clark. If you look at the guys he beats, they're kind of guys he probably should beat stylistically, and they're guys who kind of have dangerous moments, but then will kind of shell up and will and slash have washed out of the UFC. Whereas other guys with solid skills or names, he seems to... Uh, was it the uh, Be Mr. Self-Destruct? Is the, was, I believe is that the Guns N' Roses song? Jesus, Dan. Yeah. Get your old ass out of here. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, I don't know. We still haven't seen Menafield, you know, consistently go long enough to know he's not going to be a Mr. Self-Destruct himself, but he passed the Paul Craig test, which was deceptively a lot harder than it seems on paper. And so... Um, and I picked him to do that, so I'm going to pick him here to get the knockout, um, survive the Devin Clark storm, and then eventually just uh, find a right hand on him in the first is what uh, me thinks. 
Um, so I paired him up with Magni for some plus money, and uh, you get some 3x plus money if you do a three-man with Perez, Magni, and Menafield. But Magni and Menafield are the... Um, Magni obviously not a parlay piece because you could play him straight up if you wanted to. I just wanted some low chalk entry point because I didn't like a lot of names for parlays. As per usual, because parlays is stupid in MMA because it's crazy. But at the same time, I like to have a little fun, and I'm honest, so I'll be honest when I do them. Um, Herbert Burns minus 225, which, again, speaking of parlay pieces, I feel like people are going to be using him. Evan Dunham, comeback, plus 185. Now, this is tricky, man. What's Dan going to do? Evan Dunham, you know, training back at Extreme Couture, but that's where I know him from. He's got the Extreme Couture bias. Uh, coached me for a small period of time. In fact, you see uh, at the PYM podcast on Twitter, by the way, at the, give us a follow at the PYM podcast and subscribe to the YouTube channel, please. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Tom MMA. MMA. Um, really helps, but uh, you'll see the cover photo there on Twitter at the PYM podcast. I'm getting head and arm choked. Uh, that's Evan Dunham. Um, that being said, man, like I was saying on um, shout out to Wes Coleman was uh, I just didn't have the heart to do the post fight recap. Maybe I'll do one this Saturday, folks. Hit me up, shout, let me know if you want one. But I just my heart was too heavy last weekend. Not that it's any less heavy, but you know what I mean. It was all too fresh and. Um, so I couldn't do him, but I jumped on my my homeboy's one, and he was talking about that fight, and I shared an opinion on there, and I'm not going to back down from it, you know. Um, I got to be critical. Even if I'm biased, I still have to, you know, do my job to an extent and call things for they are. And Evan Dunham, I, you know, I don't like fighters coming out of retirement um, and the younger weight classes especially. Um, Evan Dunham has shown, you know, to be weak to the body in like the Matt Brown, Donald Cerrone category, which again, I love all those guys too, great fighters. It's, it's not a knock on Dunham, it's just calling it for what it is. Uh, to, to put into context how firmly in place that stereotype and, and justified it is as far as the body. And I don't like guys who have problems to the body cutting even more weight, much less older guys, much less you know, you know, the pandemic or whatever, this or that. Like it just seems like all bad moves. Now, that being said, I don't. Dis- I don't disagree with Herbert Burns being favored. However, over two to one, you got to start to worry because this is Evan Dunham. Herbert Burns doesn't have that experience. Evan Dunham is a good enough grappler. You got to imagine to stay out of his his things. And Evan Dunham was quietly, especially in that quiet winning streak he put together, it was his wrestling, uh, working hand in hand with Kyle Griffin for many years. Um, Dunham is underrated wrestling, so. You know, I could see him grappling with and taking it to Burns. However, looks like he's been doing a lot of boxing this camp. Uh, quarantined himself with uh, Master Middle Gil Martinez, boxing coach, who I was lucky enough to work very, very briefly with again back in the day. I reference him during the Michael Chandler days. Um, when you saw Chandler like actually like rolling under his twos and uh, doing some nice things boxing-wise before he just like abandoned his defense when he went to Alliance. Not hating on Alliance. I'm just, you know, that, that's kind of what happened in his career, and um, and yeah, so that's that's a good sign. But again, Burns not only is coming into his own striking, so it's hard to predict where he's at from where his career is. But he's putting his money where his mouth is, earning his first knockouts against a guy like Nate Landwer, um, you know, who, you know, is. Very, you know, his, his risk adversity is not the greatest, but he, he can box himself, you know. He's no slouch himself. Um, and uh, kicks and knees and, and, and those type of things, throwing to the body, are, are things that Herbert Burns kind of already does. And kicks and knees to the body of Hurt Dunham. Um, yeah, you know, riding off with his brother, you know, that's got to be, you know, flowing off of him. Um, it's tough, man. I'm going to pick Burns here. I don't blame anybody for playing him as their parlay piece. Obviously, I can't play this fight. It's hard for me to even pick against Dunham, but i, I got to be honest, folks. Um, it's a tough one to justify, even with the bias. Of course, I'm going to be rooting for Dunham 100%. Um, but as an analyst, giving you my opinion, yeah, uh, I think I think... I think Burns wins. Okay, let's get out of here, folks. Recapping from top to bottom. Taking 
Amanda Nunez over Felicia Spencer, taking Rafael Asuncao over Cody Garbrandt, taking Aljamain Sterling over Corey Sanhagen, taking Anthony Rocco Mart. Oh, no, no, I'm taking Neil Magny Rock. Get it right. Over Anthony Rocco Martin. Uh, taking Sean O'Malley over Eddie Wineland. Taking uh, Chase Hooper, a.k.a. Ash Ketchum, over Alex Caceres. Taking Gerald Mearshart, Coop Troop, GM3. Over Ian Heinish, a.k.a. Uh, Zach from Wedding Crashers. Taking Cody Stammen. I'm wishing him the best over Brian Boom Kelleher. Um... Taking Maki Patolo, Coconut Bombs over Charles Bird. Taking Alex Perez over Juicy A, Formiga. Taking Alonzo Menafield over Devin Bambi Clark. <laughs> Sorry for your ears. Taking Herbert Burns over Evan Dunham. Uh, parlaying uh, Menafield and Magni together for some plus money. May do a layered one and re-dip on them and add Perez for a three-leg. For fun, for fun, for a low amount. Don't follow me off the cliff. Straight plays. Rafael Sunsau plus 120, half a unit. Magni minus 135 for a unit. Mearshart plus 110, half a unit. Pitolo plus 155, half a unit. Perez by TKO plus 315, quarter unit. Avoid list. Sterling Sandhagen. Just enjoy that. Stammen Kelleher rooting for Stammen. Dunham Burns, uh, rooting for Dunham despite my pick, and uh, Caceres Hooper. All right, folks, thanks again. Please, um, if you want to hit me up at Dan Tom MMA, but please follow the show at the PYM Podcast on all social platforms. It helps. It, um, it doesn't cost you a dime. Uh, sharing the podcast, thank you guys. I do my best to retweet all the shares through either my and or the uh, Protect Your Neck Podcast account. Please subscribe to the YouTube. Really trying to build that up, folks. Really trying to uh, keep giving you guys free content there as well. Daniel Tom MMA may switch it to Dan Tom MMA, but make sure you tap in Daniel Tom MMA. And if you even want to go further, of course, you can support the podcast by going to mixedmarshallanalyst.com, the hosting site of this here show, clicking on the banners for Amazon to do your Amazon shopping or on it to do your on it shopping. Kicks a small percentage back at no extra cost to you goes right back into the show as I've been showing by purchasing new things for it um, you know these past uh, few months so it's really appreciated of course if you feel so inclined there's also a uh, PayPal donation link that goes straight to the podcast again it helps the ton during these uh, during these times I hope you guys are doing well uh, again no need to do anything financial just plugging in there if you are because it is tough times for those wise and of course um just as human beings we all need to be uh you know minding our p's and q's as far as that goes and hopefully helping our brothers and sisters of every color um but yes um of course black lives matter and of course you guys know where my heart and my support is with my brothers and sisters right now so uh i didn't want to talk about that i just wanted to mention on the way out of here as we got paris playing I love you guys, man. Um, thank you guys so much for supporting this show. Um, uh, you know, it, it sucks out there. It's hard to be on social media for anybody. So hopefully, I'm not contributing to any negative vibes. I'm really just trying to be positive uh, and helpful uh, and non-divisive. So I love you guys. Stay healthy and always protect your neck. <laughs>